I did a master's degree in exercise physiology up at UVic, and um, it didn't take me long to realize that I didn't want to devote the rest of my, my life to trying to make an athlete run a tenth of a second faster when I could walk down to the, to the mall or to the grocery store and see people filling their buggies with things that were going to kill their children. It just um, it was pretty early on in my career that something, something sort of, a big switch went off, and I, and I realized that um, it was a couple things that happened. One of the f most profound things for me was that I realized that, that what's required to perform our best on an athletic field are the, is the exact same thing that allows us to avoid cancer and diabetes and heart disease and to have self-confidence in our jobs and to raise a healthy family and, and have self-esteem and all the wonderful things that we could get from high performance. There's really absolutely no difference between what's required to perform our best in, on an athletic field or in an athletic event and in order to express our potential for health. There's really the, the same thing. And what I also realized early on was that it's very possible to increase performance at the expense of health but you will never increase your health without increasing your performance. And um, it's also a, a pretty sad statement, I think, that Olympic athletes have a, a shorter than average lifespan, and most of our professional athletes have a shorter than average lifespan. And I think we've really gotten confused in, in our society between, um, I would say, performance and health. And I think uh, I'm hopefully going to clear that up a little bit tonight. My passion is lifestyle, and um, really it's epigenetics, which is to say epigenetics is how we express our genes. And I don't know if any of you have read the book Outliers. Outliers is a great book. If you haven't read it, you should pick it up. Malcolm Gladwell is the author. And one of the great things about the book Outliers is that <clears throat> he agrees with me. But <laughs> another great thing about the book is that um, he talks about professional athletes. And really the myth busting that, that the book does is that we sort of have this belief system, or we're taught this belief system that the people who are the best at things in life are that way because of some magical gift they've been given. Some kind of magical genetic sort of, uh, you know, inheritance that they got or some other kind of special skill that they've got. And the reality is, is that human beings are more similar, similar to each other genetically than tomatoes are. We are, the most, we are the most sort of homogeneous race of any mammal on Earth. We are more alike genetically than any other creatures on earth. And yet we've sort of been sold into this idea that somehow humans are, I don't know, somehow we magically live outside the physiological laws that govern every other animal species. And, and, and we've, we've come around to this belief system and it's dictated our, of course, our beliefs always dictate our behaviors. And we now actually view not only human health, but human performance and human sickness in ways that are completely contradictory to the biological sciences. And one of the examples I often use is that, you know, in the history of biological species, there's never in the history of biology ever been a species that's gone extinct or become endangered because of bad genes or weak genes. In fact, genes, if you understand evolution at all, genes get better with time in a species because what happens is, is you kind of weed out the weak as you go. Everybody gets that? So genes get better with time in a species. That's the concept of evolution. Everybody get that? Yet here we are with, you know, we now have 80% of the people in this room, well maybe not this room, but 80% of the people in the Western world will die of chronic illness. That's lifestyle illness, that's suicide by lifestyle. 80% of the people that you pass by on the street will be dead of lifestyle illness. And um, it's interesting because we've been taught really that we should blame genes for our problems that uh, the reason the cancer rates have gone up and the heart disease rates gone, have gone up and diabetes and obesity and all the problems that cost so much money that they're bankrupting governments and it's bankrupting corporations and it's bankrupting individuals. Um, sickness is the leading cause of bankruptcy in the Western world. Not bad finances or bad stock markets or bad anything else, it's sickness. And um, so anyway, um, I think that we have to, once we understand what makes us tick, how we understand, once we understand a little bit how we work physiologically and biologically, I think that we can protect ourselves from the uh, enormous number of predators that are out there trying to take advantage and prey upon the sick or prey upon the people who want a competitive edge because it's really the same concept that if you think that you can get a competitive edge 
from a tablet or uh, from some kind of, you know, special, you know, noni juice or whatever it is someone's trying to sell you or, you know, the next greatest protein powder or super creatine, you know, whatever it is. If you actually think that you can get an advantage from that, you're, you're just wrong. Um, you can't. You're either deficient in something, and you, if you need it, you're deficient in it, and if you get enough of it, you'll improve, but you'll improve your health and your performance simultaneously. If you're not deficient in something, taking, taking it or taking more of it is, is absolutely useless. It's expensive. It's a false promise. It's why there are so many, you know, I was talking about today at lunch, how many supplements have come along in the last 10 years? that were the, the supplement of choice. They're, everybody had to have it for that six months or eight months and, they're, and they're, then they're gone and then the new one comes along and then you've got the South Beach diet, you know, the hard buns diet, the super Jane Fonda workout, the PX90, the this, the that. And so, you know, one of the things that's really confusing for people uh, is that there's just so much information, most of it, you know, misinformation. And so it's very difficult to know what to do. And you know, our ancestors had no idea what a cell was. They didn't know what a protein or a carbohydrate was. They never exercised, by the way. It, it's interesting, if you, if, you, if you read about some of the people who went and actually studied hunter-gatherer societies, and eventually um, they brought a group of them into New, to, to New York, which is what a nightmare that would be for them, but anyway. And they just were falling down laughing in Central Park because there was people jogging around in a circle for no reason. And they just couldn't understand for the life of them why you'd be so stupid as to run around in a circle when you weren't chasing something to kill it or eat it. Like they just didn't have a concept of exercise. So you have to remember humans aren't really meant, we're meant to move and, and expend energy and to work, but we're not meant to exercise and we're the only mammal on earth that ever complains that we need a vacation. You know, we do the least of any mammal on earth and we're the ones that are always whining that we need time off. I mean, otters don't say, I just gotta take some time off. You know, I can't look for fish today. It's just I'm too tired. I need a couple weeks off. And so it's, you know, why? And the answer really is stress. And I think we have stress about a lot of things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you tonight a little bit about what stress does to you. What it does not only to you physiologically, but what it does to you emotionally and how it affects your behaviors and, and your choices and your lifestyle and your health, etc. So I think... The biggest thing I want to talk about is a concept called, that, that I, I always talk about something called species-wide and species-specific. So the first thing we have to understand is that there's no species on Earth that's ever gotten sick or, or got, become endangered, become sick, or gone extinct because of genes. Can anybody think of an exception to that? There's never been a time in history where, where a biological species has gotten sick or gone extinct because of genes. So we, we can't blame our genes, it makes no sense. I often use the, what I call the Great Lakes analogy. If you think what, in the 1970s, some of you probably weren't born, but um, when all the Great Lakes got really sick, you know, the, 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 the fish started washing up on the shores with cancerous tumors, the birds that consumed those fish, their eggs were brittle, and, and they were having trouble. If you look at even things like, you know, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, one of my heroes in life, who talked about DDT and how that was just destroying the, the sort of the ecosystem. Of course, everyone called her an idiot lesbian, and now, of course, everyone's saying, my God, she was right. But anyway, that's usually what happens to people who go against the status quo, you get attacked. But if, if you actually look at those, so what biologist in the right mind would have stood up and said, you know, the problem with these fish in the Great Lakes is genes. And you might say, I mean, you, the, obviously the question would be, well, how come they didn't have cancerous tumors last year or the decade before? Well, I guess there's just been a spontaneous, you know, gene mutation that happened simultaneously throughout the entire, you know, Great Lakes. And that's why they have cancer. Who would believe that? No one. It would be, obs it would be you know, ridiculous to blame genes for a problem of an animal that becomes sick that quickly, right? Because genes don't change quickly, do they? No. So how come we believe that humans are sick because of genes? 